Hello everyone, today I'm going to be playing one of my favorite games from the DOS era, which is Epic Pinball. I just love that uh, beginning of saying, this game is not sure if my copy. I really like the uh, design of the uh, title screen, with all the uh, lights and such. Okay, that's better. Anyways, as I was saying, this episode is about Epic Pinball. Now, I'm not going to go through every single table, because that would be silly. And that's what the reviews are for. But I'm going to go over the more unique tables. And of course, we're going to be starting with the uh, shareware table of Android. Well, before I do that... Yep. There is one cheat in this game where if you go to Options... I like balls and hit F1. You'll start off with six instead of five. Of course, throughout the course of the uh, vlog, I'm also going to be talking about physics. Of course, so I'm probably sure. I'm uh, probably sure most of you uh, know pinball physics pretty well, so I'm not going to elaborate too much on it. The reason why I'm starting with this table is because, like I said, I think this is one of the more unique tables. I mean, it's not too easy, not too difficult. I think the challenge, the challenge is just right. As you can tell, I'm not doing so well, but but then again, of course, though, the purpose of DOS Logs is not to beat the game, but to rather just, well, I've said this about a million times already, to share my experiences with you guys. I really hate it when the ball just hits an unexpected uh, bump and just, yeah, like right there. I was saying about physics? Oh yes! Oh yes, pinball and physics. At least in my opinion, it goes hand in hand. Because here you're going to be talking about momentum, force. I know momentum for sure. See, I'm down to my last ball, and all of a sudden, I'm doing really well. Anyways, going back to what I was saying before, like I said, this I really like this table probably the most out of all the, uh, well, out of the three packs that the uh, game came with. Like I said, like I said, it's not too difficult, it's not too easy. Like I said, I just really like the presentation, I just like... Like how everything is just right there, you know? I mean, it's not forcing, it's not shoving stuff down your throat. And I lost my last ball. But this is just a really good table. I like it. Of course, I'm not going to put my actual name in here. But if anybody, but if any of you guys are interested in uh, getting a uh, Epic Pinball, GOG has it. Table that uh, stands out it's between Excalibur and Magic because I think it's more like Magic if I remember correctly. Now, from what I understand, if I remember correctly, 
the design of this table is actually based on older pinball tables from like, I believe like the 1920s and 1930s, I believe. I mean, I'm kind of rusty on my uh, media history, but I do remember about this in one of my lectures in when I was in college, that the pinball design tables, or the design of pinball tables, excuse me, were way different back then than they are today. But, but back then, of course, though, uh, technology was far more different. Where it's not like today, where, oh, I invent the next big thing try to make a fortune. No, back then, if you really wanted to make a fortune, you really would have to stand out. Now, of course, design-wise on this table, there isn't much to talk about. It's just, it's simple. It doesn't need to be fancy. And I think if I remember correctly, pinball difference worked differently compared to today. At least I think. I mean, like I said, I'm extremely rusty my pinball history. And I think if I remember correct correctly, the company was like Bally Williams or Bally... I'm trying to remember. And I think if I also remember correctly, they're based out of Chicago. At least I think. As you can see, the score for this table is way different from the previous table, because like I said, back then, pinball design was way different. It didn't have all the neon lights and flashy, uh, and the flashy scores and all that. No, this one was just more basic and straightforward. We're gonna call this one okay. Let's see here, I'm gonna go back to this one here, because I think... Excalibur is another one that kind of stands out to me because I think this one was based on later designs. The I think either the 60s or 70s pinball. I I'm trying to remember. Because like I stated before, back in Magic, uh, the des pinball design was way different back then compared to today. goes into the uh goes in the little uh, pocket right there and you'll lose your ball. This table is to hit both blue, uh, hit the blue and the red bumper. Down my last ball already. And I only lit up the E. Which really isn't saying much. Meh. Well, that sucked. But we'll call this one meh. Because I know I could do way better. This one's another uh, standout table because this one actually, you can say, quote unquote, promotes uh, Jill of the Jungle, which I already covered in another DOS vlog. And 
And like I said, it was not uncommon for game companies like Epic and Apogee to promote one of their own games within another. But that was business tactics back then, you know? It's their way of saying, hey, you like our pro you like one product? Well, let me introduce let me show you another. Of course, this is all before internet and uh, all that. One thing I, that's the one thing I really liked about this table is that whenever you go up, it kind of has that foggy effect like you're above the floor's canopy. Or the forest floor, or what, jungle floor, whatever. Bottom line, you're above the trees. Even someone like me is not safe from uh, forgetfulness. Oh, there was actually one thing I forgot to mention is precision. If you don't hit the if you don't hit the ball just right on the flipper, you're not going to guide the ball towards its destination. Don't you just love it? You start a quest and all of a sudden, five seconds later, you blew it. Oh, looks like I get a second chance. Very nice. So as I was saying before, for uh, this table in particular, it was not uncommon for games to promote one of their own within. Like for example, I'm playing Epic Pinball and I'm playing a table that's promoting Jill of the Jungle. Like I said before, it's just basic business. This is another one that really stands out. Actually, I think out of all the tables, this one stands out the most. And you'll see why. Well, first of all, in my opinion, at least uh, this one has the best soundtrack. As you can 
Let's see with the uh Ball, but that's all right. <clears throat> We're here anyways. As you can see, the table changed from red to purple, which I got to admit, is, I think is a really nice touch. At least it tells you you're on the next level. What was I saying about before the music? Oh yes, I think the music in this level actually stands out the most. I can listen to this music for hours, but I'm not going to. Yeah, one thing I will admit about Epic Games is that uh, a lot of their games have, have a great soundtrack, and I'm surprised that uh, not until recently that uh, people have posted soundtracks on YouTube. But one thing I'm kind of surprised is that uh, I'm surprised Epic hasn't stopped any of them for uh, infringement. I can't guarantee I'm gonna make it to level four, which is the last level. But hey, at least uh, unless you guys get an idea of how uh, this table works. Oh, I forgot to mention one thing. Uh, this has spoilers, so if you guys are listening to this and don't want anything spoiled for you, then I suggest going by the game. There goes my ball. Did I make mention already that the ball changes every time you lose it? I might have. But yeah, I think... <laughs> and there goes my last ball. What a shocker. I like how it just says, game over. But this one was alright, so we're gonna give this one... Okay. Now, saying before about the Enigma pinball table, is it? This I would rank number two behind Android because the design was. I think the design was really, really, really good. I mean, it may not look like there's a whole lot going on, but there is a lot going on. Each time the uh, bumpers showed up, that just added more and more to the uh, mystery and added more to the table, which makes it stand out even more. And when it comes to soundtrack, this would rank number two, because I can imagine this song being played at like a nightclub late at night. Now unlike, now, unlike the Enigma table, getting the girl to change her color from her hair and her coat is a lot more difficult. I mean, getting part one is pretty easy. It's part two that, uh, that is not so. As you can see with the CPU hog, you have to hit the ball in there, which will light up the tents. Oops. As I was saying, which will light up the tense deck, and you have to do that, I think, four or five times. Then you have to shoot the ball into the tense deck, and that'll change your hair and coat, which I doubt I'm gonna, which I doubt I'll uh, get.
Ah, this one's kind of a meh performance. I think I have room for one more. Let's see here. Now these, now the tables I'm picking are in no particular order. This one right here. And I don't have the original manual, and it seems like uh, the designer's choice, I think, from what I understand, was this one. But I'm not gonna waste my time scavenging through my desk just to find the manual. Oh, one thing I forgot to point out into the, uh, in the game is like how it says into the ocean, like as if your ball's the diver. Yeah, that's a, it's a nice touch, but it just, I think it's just pushing certain boundaries. I mean, I get it, it's just part of the design. I got one wish granted. I got into the ship. Shoot any hole for millions. I like the reef hole. Huh? There goes that. Two mysteries of the ship uh, solved. First, finding the ship and finding the gold. The next time will be gems, but I don't think I'm going to be able to get to it because this is the last ball. Uh oh, 
shark attack. Shoot the ship to get the shark to leave. Jeez, don't you think that's enough S's in this uh, table? Well, speaking of enough, I guess that's the end of my journey. This one I think we did all right, so we'll call this one a yeah. And I think that's what we're gonna do for this session. But before I end it, um, I want you, I want to share this screen with you guys. This game is not shareware. Please do not copy it or upload it. Yeah, I gotta admit though, um, piracy was way different back then than it is today. In fact, if I remember correctly from one of my other games, if you actually own a pirated copy of a game. There's one little screen that says, okay, um, go to page XX and enter this code in here. And if you didn't have the manual, well, then you're out of luck. And another thing I'm going to point out is that if you look at the right of the screen, this is actually one of the few games where you can buy individual uh, packs instead of uh, all the packs at once. In fact, if you look at it, if you get all three packs, you would have to pay $59, whereas if you pay for any two, it's $45 and... Any individual pack was 29 Like I said before, not a lot of games offered this option. In fact, it was actually cheaper just to buy it by the bulk anyways. Um, let's see, what else was there going to add? Oh, yes. And also, and also all orders in, add $4 processing and handling, $6 international, and Maryland residents add 5% sales tax. Like I said before, this was all before the internet where you can just buy stuff online. What it was is you actually had to get an actual order form and you actually had to write down what you want. You had to put the uh, check or the money order or whatever. Or you'd have to call directly and have them give them your credit card number and tell them what you're interested in and all that fun stuff. And this was all before internet. Um, I think there's nothing else for me to explain with that. If you tuned into this, thank you for listening. I'll see everybody next time. Oh, and one last thing. If I said anything that was either inaccurate or incorrect, let me know in the comments, all right? And I'll see everybody next time.